Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to another episode of Christ in Prophecy. We're so glad that you've joined us. Did you know that out of all the end time signs, the greatest is the miraculous regathering of the Jewish people back to the Holy Land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel? After all, what country has ever been brought back from the dead after nearly two millennia and being God's chosen people? An Old Testament nation pulled right out of the Bible and once considered long gone has been reborn in our day. And this remarkable event is incredibly significant, for this end time sign points directly to the return of Jesus Christ to set up His throne in Jerusalem, and that's being just on the horizon. Every year, Nathan and I attend the Pre-Trib Study Group Conference in the Dallas, Texas area. This is where the professors of prophecy come to share their research. It's an exciting meeting for those who love eschatology, and all who attend leave even more passionate about the Lord's soon return. We always invite some of our colleagues who study Bible prophecy to engage with us in a dialogue about key topics. Well, today we'd like to share some of our conversation exploring why Israel's return is so important. We'll start with our own founder, Dr. David Reagan, who interestingly enough was also one of the founders of the Pre-Trib Conference. Well, we'll let him tell you all about it. What is the greatest of the end time signs? Well, folks, we have actually brought in the <laughs> resident expert from Lamb and Lion Ministries, at least the man who started all this. Nathan and I obviously are here because of Dr. David Reagan. And so we brought uh, Dave himself to answer some of our questions while we are gathered at the pre-trib conference here in Dallas, Texas. So Dave, thanks always for being a part. Uh, we're excited just to hear to your perspective. You. <laughs> well, you've not ever been very, very far, but we're always glad when That's you right. come back. Well, speaking of pre-trib conference, weren't you wanting the, one of the founding members, or at least the founding I was, ideas uh, of the, the 31 conference? 31 years ago, and uh, we, okay. uh, we had 30 people there. Wow. <laughs> it's gotten a lot bigger since. So you yeah. and Tim LaHaye. And yeah, now Tim LaHaye, Chuck Missler, Dave Hunt, and some people. And in those early years, it usually every meeting was just a very short meeting, and it always ended up to be a debate between Chuck Missler and Dave Hunt. They always went after each other. <laughs> well, we have a lot of things we could debate about, but really we are in agreement that the Lord's coming soon. Amen. And so what is the sign that you think, Dave, is the greatest sign or the convergence of signs that we're witnessing right now that He is coming? Well, if I had to select an individual sign, I would say it has to do with the signs that relate to the nation of Israel, because all of end time Bible prophecy focuses upon the nation of Israel. I always say Israel is God's prophetic time clock, because in the Bible it'll say, this is going to happen in the end times when that happens to the Jews, and this is going to happen when that happens to the Jews. Even Jesus, for uh, when in His Olivet Discourse mentioned, He said, you know, um, watch Jerusalem. And he said, Jerusalem's going to be under the Gentiles for a long time, but when Jerusalem is no longer under the Gentiles, I'm coming back. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, and that in our lifetime, or at least in my That's lifetime, right. uh, 1967, when the Jewish people yep. in the nation of Israel right. reclaimed the old city, and they are there to stay. Yes, and that uh, interesting thing about that is that uh, uh, most churches are sound asleep about all oh. this, and uh, instead of getting their people ready for the Lord's return, or teaching or preaching pop psychology, you know, the number one question we get seems that our ministry is, I live in so and so place, do you know a Bible believing church? Because there's so few and far between these days. But the interesting thing is that in Israel, the Orthodox Jews are expecting the Messiah any moment, because they know that their scriptures say He's coming when they're back in the land and back in the city. So they're expecting Him. And they're going to be surprised, not by His coming, but by who His identity is what's going to surprise yes. them. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, we were talking just earlier uh, with Mondo Gonzalez, who said even of late, the Sanhedrin, which has oh, yeah. been brought back into existence, they have actually begun dialoguing with evangelical Christians to say, now what is it that you believe? And they're grappling with some of these things. Yeah. So I think we really are on the cusp 
of a breakthrough even within the Jewish uh, culture well, and, and, and as you well know the Orthodox Jews in Israel are doing everything they can to prepare for the Messiah they're they're getting everything together for the temple they're training the priests and, yes. and so forth I mean they they really believe the Messiah is coming soon earlier this year you gave a fantastic presentation we'll put the link below to one of our conferences where you presented what the Messianic or yes. excuse me, the Orthodox All rabbis the things they're doing. are doing what are some of those well, uh, the, the formation of the Sanhedrin, yeah. which uh, they had tried several times before, it didn't click, but boy, they've got it going now. And uh, the uh, Temple Institute in Jerusalem, which is making all the clothes for the priests, they've made the high priest's uh, clothes, his, his uh, shield in the front with the various ornaments on it, his crown, they have built uh, the table of showbread, uh, they've uh, got the, uh, uh, the candlestick, which cost Oh, the menorah. About a million dollars, a huge candlestick made out of gold. You know what I found out just recently? That candlestick was actually paid for by a very wealthy Ukrainian Jew. So exactly. even as you see Ukraine in the news yeah. today, it was a Ukrainian Jew, the leader of a Jewish community there, that paid for that menorah. So, and In fact, uh, uh, one of the leaders recently said that when they get the signal to go, they can put up the... Uh, temporary temple, which they're going to put up first, within four hours. They have everything ready, everything ready. It's going to be the Tabernacle of Moses, which was a tent temple, yes. which they'll put up there and then start building the uh, real temple around it. Wow. But well, they're going to offer sacrifices immediately. And what do you think will be the, the prophetic event that will allow the Jewish people back on the Temple Mount? Well, it's only speculation uh, that I can give you because I don't know. But I've been writing a book on the nine wars of the end times. And one of the things when I started writing about Gog and Magog, one of the things that jumped off the page at me is it says that when the Russians and all of their allies come against Israel and land on the mountains of Israel, that God will destroy them in certain ways. And it says the main thing he's going to use is a gigantic earthquake that he says, it says point blank, will level every wall in Israel. And I think that earthquake is just going to collapse the Dome of the Rock. And then the Antichrist will come in, make his agreement with the Jews, and bang, they'll start building their temple. And bang. Next up is Pete Garcia, a noted prophecy teacher and author who will prove to us that Israel's rebirth is no accident. Is Israel an accident of history? The signs of the end times point to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming soon, but what are exactly these end time signs? We have Pete Garcia here, a, a author of many Bible prophecy books and chapters. He's joined Tim and me here at the Pre-Trib Research Center Conference in here. Dallas, Thank Texas. You. Good to be here. Hey man, so good to have you here. Yeah. So Pete's gonna tell us a little about what these signs that Jesus gave us that point to his soon return. All right. Well, uh, Charles Ryrie coined a phrase back a few years ago, the sine qua non of without which there is not, right? Talking about uh, dispensationalism, talking about the, the importance of, uh, of Israel. And I think kind of taking that and in, in, in bringing that over to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, I look at the rebirth of Israel as the without which there isn't uh, the, the, all the other signs that are given in the Olivet Discourse, the 11 or so that so are given. So when you say the Olivet Discourse, that's D Jesus teaching in Matthew 24 about the end times? Yeah, Matthew 24, okay. Mark 13, uh, Luke, Luke 21. 21. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, in recent years, people have tried to uh, kind of dismiss or downplay the importance of Israel. Uh, but they'll talk about the other signs, the wars, rumors of war, the deception, the uh, lawlessness, and all these other things that are given there. But I think without Israel back in the picture, none of those things really uh, have any context because we've always had wars, we've always had deception, we've always had lawlessness to certain degrees in certain places. Um, but what makes it uh, important and it gives us context to where we are in history on God's prophetic calendar is that Israel's back as a nation back in our land, just as it was prophesied in Amos 9 and other places. Yeah. So. And why is that miraculous? I mean, does any other nation in history come back after being dead for 1900 years? No, I don't think so. I don't. You know, it's miraculous to me as well, not only the fact that Israel came back, but for all the, the years of the church age, there were Christians who believed the Word of God, even though they said, I don't imagine how Israel is going to come back, but the Lord said it's going to happen, so I trust that it will. And even back into the 19th century, the 1800s, uh, and the early 1900s, there yeah. were Christian Zionists who were supportive of Israel reestablishing itself as a nation because that's what the Word of God said. So they were faithful. 
And that's why today, even as sometimes we don't understand how it's all going to come to pass, if we believe the Word of God, then we can be instruments of Him affecting even world history today. Yeah, I think William Blackstone, was yes. that his name? Uh, 1908 or 1909, his book, Jesus is Coming, uh, said that Israel had to be a nation again. Uh, the great Clarence Larkin, who who is my spiritual grandfather, if you want to call it that. I mean, that's one of the first books that I've ever really, you know, studied, uh, you know, spoke about Israel becoming a nation again. Uh, Schofield, all the greats back in the 1800s spoke about Israel having to become a nation again. Why does it have to become a nation again? Why prophetically, if folks don't know, because you'll hear people all the time say, well, Israel's just a, a modern accident, or like you said, Christian Zionists just wanted it to happen and they worked the politics to make it happen. It had bears no significance of the future, but why is it significant to God? Well, God, uh, through the angel Gabriel, prophesied to Daniel that there would be 70 weeks of years for the nation of Israel, and this would be in, in context to a, a covenant relationship. Uh, we know that 69 weeks of years uh, were ended with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, or you know, him being cut off there in 926, or versus Daniel 926, not the year 926. <laughs> um, but uh, he was cut off, and then there was this uh, uh, verse 927 where it talks about this covenant that's going to have to take place and all this. Well, we know historically that never happened. Uh, there wasn't anything between the, the death of Christ in around 30 AD to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Nothing fulfills that, and we know that after that point, there wasn't a temple in existence, and it's still not in existence till today. So it is coming. It is coming, and what's unique is that. When you marry that up with other prophetic uh, passages in Ezekiel 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones, where, where God's telling Ezekiel that this, 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 the nation of Israel is going to come back, but they're going to come back in unbelief. Mm -hmm. And we see that today. So everything that the Bible's talked about that has to take place is taking place. And it gives context to all these other signs that we're seeing. It, it certainly does. I think we have to, to have a degree of humility, but as, as, at the same time, we have to trust that if we read and believe the Word of God, then it is true. And so even as the setup to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus has been walking through Jerusalem and, and what happens there in the first verse, and they see all the buildings, all the great and grand edifice of the temple, the, the wall that we can still go and visit today in Jerusalem, and His disciples are, are amazed at just the grandeur of it, but He says all these things will not be left one stone upon another. And it is later when He is sitting on the Mount of Olives, therefore the Olivet Discourse, that the disciples come to Him in verse 3 of chapter 24 and say, tell us, when will these things happen? The destruction that He had described earlier, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And although the disciples at that moment didn't have the, the big picture, so to speak, they, they still didn't understand everything Jesus had already said to them, they at least understood those three things. And the Lord didn't say, wait, 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 fellas, you got it all wrong. I'm not coming back. No, no. Yeah. The end of the age? No. No, He, he did not disagree with their big picture understanding, and so he went on to describe the signs of his coming and of the end of the age. And I think that's instructive to us. We may not have every detail figured out. I don't, I don't and Nathan and I probably would both agree in that regard, but we trust the Word of God and we trust what He said, that He is coming back and that there is going to be an end even to this very sinful and darkening age we're living in right now. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that it is the Bible does give us an outline. It gives us the specific hard points that we're going to see that will take place that will be uh, mile markers, if you will. Um, and there are things that do catch us by surprise. Obviously, the events of 2020 caught us by a, a lot of prophecy uh, instructors by, by surprise. But they everything that's happening, all of the signs that we're seeing, all of the convergence, these are the signs piling upon other signs that are indicative of the birth pangs, right? That that comes with increasing intensity and frequency, and it's gonna come to a culmination point. But everything we're seeing is always trending towards mm. yes. prophetic fulfillment. And at an accelerating pace lately. Yeah. yeah the absolutely. birth is the end of the tribulation, the return of Jesus Christ to set up His kingdom on His earth, where He rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Hence, you need a nation of Israel, though refined and as a remnant that believes in Christ. And it's all heading towards that, and it's, it's going frequently, yes, more frequently, more intensely, like birth pangs, as you said, right? Yeah, and I, I'm, you know, being military, I look back, kind of everything, you, you start from the event and you backwards plans to wherever you're gonna go to or wherever you're starting from. So in order for there to be a temple that's gotta be desecrated, there has to be a temple, right? There has right. to be, uh, uh, 
a Jewish people in control of the Temple Mount that want to build this temple. People, Jewish people have to be in control of Jerusalem, have to be in control of the nation. I mean, if you just kind of work your way backwards from, from that event in uh, Matthew 24, 15, where the, the, the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, we're seeing all these things. And I think even today we're starting to see this fervor amongst uh, Israelis that are, that are longing. You know, they, the rabbis keep talking about being in a messianic age. This is a messianic era. And I think that's 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 stirring something in the people there it to is. want to build a temple, to want to kind of go to to change the status quo and kind of take that next step. So. And I think one of the key things that we point to Bible prophecy is you said you, you understand an event and then you work backwards uh, to kind of build up to where that that is leading to. Well, Bible prophecy already knows what the end is yeah. <laughs> and it tells us what the buildup is. So as we study Bible prophecy, the Lord's already foretold and foreshadowed and all we have to do is, is read Read, study, there's that, that five letter word again, to have understanding. And there's things we will not understand, yeah. but you know, God has revealed aspects to us that He wants us to understand. And so we should discern that the end is drawing near. And if you're watching this program today, I can assure you all of us are looking forward to not just the birth pangs, the signs for the sake of signs, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for His church as promised in Scripture because He said He will rescue us from the wrath to come. That's the tribulation Nathan spoke about. And so we hope that you too have put your faith in Jesus Christ so that you can be delivered from the wrath to come and go to be with our glorious bridegroom who is coming for His bride the church soon and very soon. And Amen. there are no signs that have to be fulfilled before that glorious event. No, it could happen at any moment. In fact, uh, I was hoping it would happen today at some point. <laughs> Mondo Gonzalez of Prophecy Watchers will now join us. I actually first met Mondo at the Pre-Trib Conference about a year before. And as I've gotten to know him, I've been quite impressed with how God has blessed Mondo with great skill in teaching the Bible. And he always exudes the joy of the Lord, lifting us up in our discussions. Mondo and I have traded articles in our respective magazines on the so-called red heifers. We asked him to comment on their significance and why it's so important that Christians today reach out to the Jewish people with the soul-saving good news of Yeshua the Messiah. What is the significance of the red heifers? Well, welcome again to another Prophetic Perspective and to a conversation with Mondo Gonzalez as we're here together at the Pre-Trib Conference in Dallas, Texas. Mondo, always a delight to be with you. We know you've been working on some exciting things relative to some of the buzz that's in the news right now with what's happening in Israel. Tell us about what you've been working on. So, as everybody knows, back in September, five red heifers were sent over to Israel from here, Texas. and uh, so. We're, I've been working on some research and material just to kind of provide an overall framework of what the Christians should think. And again, you guys have been involved in that in the sense of shaping the average Christian is asking, well, what do I do with this information? You know, we know that it's part of the prophetic fulfillment. How should I respond? Should I jump on board? Should I support it? Should I not? It's, it's really, I think, a helpful conversation. Well, these red heifers, what is the significance? Why don't we start with that? Because yeah, we've heard in the news, come from? why do we need these these red cows. So <laughs> th th this is good because biblically you have a, the red heifer ceremony in Numbers 19. So, but we, we, we take scripture solid, but what we're dealing with now is um, in addition to that is the feeling and the, and the thinking of the modern uh, rabbinic movement or the Orthodox movement or even the, the, the religious Jewish movement in Israel, uh, the Temple Mount Faithful, the Temple Mount Institute, the Temple Institute. These are these groups that have been really for the last 30 years at least trying to find the red heifer. Why? Because their goal is to build a temple. Uh, they, they, they believe, according to Moses, that's the only way they can connect with God. The temple is destroyed in AD 70. So that you have their framework and then you have our perspective, which we understand the Bible does say, uh, Matthew 24, 15, Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 11, even Daniel. So you have these four witnesses scripture that there's going to be a temple during the tribulation period. So we're looking at that fact and then through deduction, <laughs> we're in inference, we're moving backwards to say, well, how does that happen? It doesn't just voila up here. So there's, what are the steps that happen so that when we see that, so us watching the events unfold, enter the red heifer. So the red heifer, 
traditionally is meant to purify those that are unclean. And so the, the, the cow itself? Or well, after the ashes. So they oh, burn okay. it. Numbers okay. 19, they burn it. Rub against a cow. Kind of what we call a holy cow, huh? Yes, yeah. a holy cow. <laughs> a holy cow. So they burn it yeah. in, a, in a pit. They take the ashes, they mix it with water, and now they have this uh, opportunity to where you can spread it and cleanse people that are unclean. So to a degree, a lot of Christians have always focused on the temple, which is a building, which is a structure. Yep. But the Jewish mind is, before we can get to the structure, we have to focus on again, Jewish thinking, the heart, and so the way that we purify the heart and the land, the the, yes. the real estate to be able even to build the temple is to have the red heifer whose ashes will lend to purification according to Numbers 19. So bingo, again, yes. okay, bingo. Some of the evangelical expectation of a temple is preceded by the purification, and we don't agree with, with the fact that you can be purified other than by the blood of Jesus yes. Christ, yep. but we're trying to understand the Jewish mindset in preparing for the temple itself. And I think God, I mean, we know as well that what's God's goal with the Jewish people? He wants to save them. I mean, the, the tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have a long talk during the seven-year period, and his goal is at the end, all Israel will be saved. And so God knows, uh, as all of us were stiff-necked, but I mean, the Bible says that you have this group of people, his goal is to introduce them to Jesus, for them to consider it, and it takes seven years for them to come to that point. But they're working from their frame of reference, which is Moses and the temple. And so God's like, okay, well, we're, I'm going to work through your frame of reference in order to get you to my, to my son. And so that requires all these other pre things. And so the red heifers that we see now have been there again, you, you can go back and, and they've been in motion. Many of them are disqualified. I mean, I've written about them many times over the years and like, Oh, let's watch because what you have is, um, there's a timing factor too, which I think is pretty fascinating because in Numbers 19, it doesn't give you the age of, there's two Hebrew words, one for one for a, a male, or one for an adult cow, or an, an aged cow, and one for a calf. So it talks about an aged cow. So in rabbinic thinking, again, that's what matters, two years and eight days, that's how old they have to be. And depending on the rabbis, they argue yeah, that and for even the, <clears throat> even the red heifer part, they've added specifications on how many white hairs yep, and how many this, how many that. So they so took something this, easy and made it more complex. <laughs> oh, yeah, made it much more complex <laughs> and many other rules that you yep. just think, well, wow, goodness, who can keep up with this? But it's exciting because what's interesting about it is um, that the the political and the religious climate within the nation Israel itself is shifting. I mean, you go back 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was very common within the rabbinic mindset. You were not allowed to go on the Temple Mount because that was just the rule. And if you did, you were ostracized. Man, that is not the case now. That, that Even that climate has shifted. There's thousands of Jews, um, mainly religious Jews, that are going up on the Temple Mount every year they're, and they're doing their secret prayers. So even the fact that you see this shift um, now uh, with the latest government in Israel, it's the, it's the most religious ever in the history of Israel, 64 seats, uh, Netanyahu um, feels, I got this from an interview I did yesterday where this person heard from Netanyahu himself that he feels it's his destiny, Netanyahu, to build the third temple now. Wow. So Mondo, is then the red heifer the last piece of the puzzle? I mean, with that, can they now start rebuilding the temple? Um, yeah, from a Jewish perspective, I would say from their thinking, yes, this is what they're waiting for. And I think in addition that all these things are, you know, simultaneously happening is the political will that you see of Netanyahu's perspective of the new religious government. But you also see that the biggest challenge is what's going to be the response of the Muslims? Because uh, according to the, the plans that I've seen, they're, they're not going to, they're going to build the temple next to the Dome of the Rock next to the Dome with the Rock. a wall that would separate, you know, does that, does that go along with Revelation 11 where uh, leave the outer court for the Gentiles? Maybe, I don't know. Um, how that all works, it doesn't really, um, all we know is that's the thinking that seems to be the current thinking as the plans that are, that are the designs are done. Um, so all the temple stuff, all those other things are done, but what's, what's holding, the red, the, the, the red heifer ashes are what's holding back the opportunity to cleanse, as you mentioned, the real estate. But politically speaking, the Sunnis now with the Abrahamic Accords, they um, are buddy-buddy with Israel. They need Israel to uh, keep uh, Iran at bay, that's the Shiites. But they're coming to the point now where they are not opposing the idea of Israel having a temple because they need it. So what I, what I perceive or envision is Netanyahu, uh, being a very skilled uh, politician, is um, not going to, um, he might not even 
let's say, bomb Iran and neutralize them until he gets concessions from the Sunnis about some of the things that are happening there. Because he's, that's his leverage. If he, if he neutralizes them, they're going to go, well, then, hey, it's done. I can actually validate what you're saying about the, the shifting uh, dynamic within the Middle East, especially the Muslim countries that are immediate near, nearby, not the Palestinians, who has a whole other issue. But there was an imam from Saudi Arabia who made this statement, if Israelis take an inch of land from Mecca or Medina, I will be the first to oppose them. That's our land. But if they want their own land back, only a dishonest crook and a lying thief would deny them the right of return. Jerusalem is not ours, meaning the Muslims, and never was, period. Wow. That is a yep. shift from years gone by. So we can see the dynamics come into play that we never would have imagined, and, and yet our own administration seems to want to kowtow to the Iranians and others. Let's get back to another point, though. All of this red heifer discussion is in the minds of, of fervent Israelis and Jews who are committed to rebuilding the temple the required step to be able to purify the land themselves. They even have ways that they're trying to purify young priests to raise up to even be able to, to sacrifice the, uh, the heifer. But for those of us who are Christians, we realize that all this is to a degree misguided because it doesn't immediately point to Jesus Christ. That really is the only means of salvation. And so part of our manifestation of love for the Jews is to share the Messiah with them. Yeah. Right now. Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt. We, we have this interesting uh, dynamic because we have, I mean, God hasn't changed his mind. He doesn't have a dual covenant, a you know, different covenant with the Jews. Um, um, so we have the scripture which tells us what's going to be during this period. And then we have the truth of where salvation is. And we're trying to share with them, you know, the, the, the reality is that, hey, this is, you're doing these things, but at the end of the day, it's not gonna provide you salvation. We know that. Uh, they aren't saved through, the, through this third temple. Uh, they're saved through what their actions do, and they bring in, and they get ground down all the way to the, you know, the, to the end of the tribulation when they call out on the name of the Lord. Because Jesus said, you'll see me again when you call, <laughs> yeah. you know, blessed is he who comes. So we, we see that. So we have this interesting tension as a Christian yeah. by we see the prophetic scriptures, which are fact, but we also know that salvation is only through this way. Why well, I ascribe to what Tim said, because it, to support the building of the temple is supporting keeping people captured in a workspace salvation that sends them to hell. And so why would any Christian want to support that? The Messiah is Jesus Christ. Putting your faith and trust in Him is where the money should be put, at least in my opinion. As you can see, the greatest out of all the end time signs has been the miraculous regathering of the Jewish people back to the Holy Land and the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And while the rapture of the church doesn't need any event to happen before Christ comes to catch those saved up to heaven because the rapture is an imminent event, the tribulation time period requires the nation of Israel to exist. And now it does. So that means if the tribulation is right on the horizon, then the rapture of the church is that much sooner. How exciting. <laughs> you sure know it sure is, Nathan. And we hope that you too have become just as excited as we are. In our next episode, we'll return to the pre-trib conference to explore yet another sign of the end times that points to the soon return of Jesus Christ, the rise of the Antichrist. Teachers such as Jeff Kenley, J.B. Hickson, Job Martin, and others will be joining us for this important look into the sudden rise of a one-world government, the dangers that globalism places on our freedoms, and how Christians can survive and thrive in these dark days. You won't want to miss this episode. Until then, look up and be watchful for the Lion of Judah is about to roar back onto the scene.